Booyah. Why are the rich getting richer? Why are the rich getting richer? Why are the poor getting poorer? Why are the middle class, instead of getting richer, they're getting broker? What's cracking, everybody? Money Smart Guy Matt Zapala here, hailing to you from the Money Smart Moments headquarters here at the PHP agency. By the way, I'll make sure a couple things. I, I've got a very exciting show for you guys. Um, I'm very excited to have some, some of my friends on the show. If some of you guys are logging in and some of you guys are chiming in right now, if you haven't done so already, I've got a special giveaway. I've got a special giveaway if you are sharing this live stream, if you are located in the Chicagoland area. But if you share this live stream, I'm speaking at an event this Saturday called the Murder Mediocrity Event. This Saturday, a bunch of speakers there, health and wellness experts, relationship experts, purpose and spirituality experts. I'm giving, I'm giving the financial topic about personal finance. But the person that shares this live stream the most, by the time the broadcast is over with, about 45 minutes, I will select two of you guys because I have two tickets to be my guest at the Murder Mediocrity event this Saturday, March 31st here in Chicago. So I guess if you're in Chicago, it pertains to you. And I'd like to give you a t two tickets between you and your spouse or you and your better half to come to the Murder Mediocrity event starts uh, in the morning. I'll be there in the afternoon. We have a team meeting uh, uh, that Saturday, but it's the Murder Mediocrity event tickets. Uh, it's I think it's $100 a go. It's going to be for free from me if you share this live stream broadcast the most times before this broadcast ends in about 30, 45 minutes. So let's get back down to why we're uh, doing this live stream to begin with. Why are the rich are getting richer? And by the way, it's really not that hard. It's really not that difficult. A few reasons why. Number one, the economy. The reason why the rich are getting richer is because the people that know about money are using the economy to its benefit. Yeah, you can say politics this and presidents this, but listen, if they understood money, the, the economy is really here to help out those who are taking advantage of what we call the free enterprise in, in, in a system called capitalism. And, I, and I'll get into it here later on the show, uh, but I just want to share these points real quick because I have some guests that are going to be articulating these points too as well. You don't have to have a pedigree. You don't have to have a college degree. You don't have to have uh, the right proper last name to come from. But number one, the, uh, part of the economy is the inflation. You know, part of the fact that uh, the, the America keeps printing money, which makes the value of money less. Number two, lack of financial literacy. What's the last time you remember going through a grade school and high school learning about the rules of the money game? Right? And I think some of you guys took child development classes. Uh, guys, we took uh, shop, woodwork, pipe fitting, auto mechanics to learn how to get a job later on down the road. It wasn't how to master money. So number one, economy. Number two, lack of financial education. Number three, leadership. The last time I checked growing up in the neighborhood I grew up in, the guys who were making money were the drug dealers or the athletes. Yep. Those are the guys making money. So there were very few entrepreneurs that I ever looked up to. An entrepreneur is a hero in my community. Why? Do you realize that an entrepreneur, a capitalist, is actually one giving out jobs because they decided to take some risk and put their neck out there? So joining me on the show today, I want to introduce my guests. If, uh, if, you, want to, if you want to bring them on here, Brandon. We've got both Alejandro Aguilar and Ricky Aguilar, brothers, uh, brothers from Bakersfield, California. There they are, from Bakersfield, California, grew up in the hood. Uh, they got recruited into entrepreneurship and the insurance industry out of the oil fields. Yeah. So, uh, so you know, Alejandro, I know Ricky's the older brother right there in the middle. Right, right. But Alejandro, I want to start with you okay. uh, because uh, for those of you who are watching this live stream, uh, how, how do you guys get involved in a business and you have an older sibling kind of give you a hard time about you making a decision going business? So, Alejandro, can you share a little bit about what it was like for you to transition from the oil fields to go consider even going in business for yourself? Oh, okay. So, uh, Matt, by the way, thank you so much, guys. You guys already know Matt, Matt Zapala. Um, By the way, great role model. Uh, we look up to you, brother, since the day we got started to the business, man. It, it's crazy. As soon as you came into our firm, um, the, the expansion of the company, you've just been a, a complete flag carrier of the company. So we appreciate your mentorship. Uh, and the, let, me t let me tell you guys the transition, how it was. Uh, when I got started, I was 23 years old, uh, and I, I come from the oil fields. I didn't go to college. My parents are from Mexico, Michoacan, right? So if you're from Mexico or you're Mexican, Latino, then, then you know what I'm talking about. So I grew up with hardworking parents, but I grew up in two different, uh, two different lifestyles. Let me give you an example, man. Matt. So I grew up with a father who was an entrepreneur. So my dad and my mom were both from Mexico, Pacan. They both jumped the border. They're both immigrants. 
okay? Yep. They both come to America for opportunity. They both put their life at risk. They both could have died in the desert. They both could have lost everything. They both, they both could have had a, a very, very tragic story, but they didn't. They survived and they made it to America. That was a huge risk already as itself. So when they come here, my dad has a mentality that says, I don't care if I'm an immigrant. My dad's five foot four, short, little dark Mexican, right? He looks, <laughs> I don't know how he came out. So I don't know if it was the beans or the tortillas, but something made us a little bit tall. You get me? And uh, it's funny yeah, because- Your brother's like, my, my, that too. Yeah, man. Like, well, he used to steal my food too. So that, 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 that's not fair. <laughs> <funny. laughs> but other brothers do. Yeah, man. So, but you know, you know, the funny part is I saw my dad be an entrepreneur, man. He opened up restaurants, dealerships. You know, he didn't speak English, didn't have papers, but he he moved. You know, he was. He says, "I came to America for opportunity. I came to embrace the opportunity to give you guys a better life." I'm like, "Dad, but we didn't even exist." He's like, "Yeah, but I, I thought about my kids, my kids' future before they even existed." I was like, "Wow, you know." So I saw my dad. He took us to look. He took us to Puerto Vallarta, Huatulco, Acapulco, Mexico, de, uh, Mexico DF, uh, to the pyramids. He took us to, I mean, he took us everywhere. Uh, 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 Disneyland, Cal for Adventure, Six Flags. And most people think, oh, that's not a lot. Well, you look, when your dad takes you constantly because he's self-employed, the life that we lived was on his terms, not on somebody else. He used to say, son, you're never going to watch me call somebody a boss. I'm not going to let my kids watch me call another man a boss. My dad used to tell me that as a kid. And then my mom, on the other hand, she, my mom was a waitress. My mom, were, our parents were separated. So I saw my mom being a waitress and she would, I would see her stress out and cry over bills. I was five years old when I realized that my mom was struggling financially. I remember my mom driving different cars than my dad. I remember seeing my mom not be able to pay bills. I remember my mom only taking us to skate land because that's, you know, it was challenging for having a boss. I remember when she wanted to have a weekend off, she, want, she would call her coworker and and Ricky, I don't know if you remember this, but she'd be on the phone back in the day. It wasn't cell phones. It was the ones that were connected, you know, on the line. And we'd be like, Mom, what did your coworker say? Is she going to sh change the shift with you so you can take the weekend off, so you can take the skate land? And depending on her face expression was depending if we we're going to go to skate land or not. I remember that. And I said, growing up, I said, what life do I want? Mm -hmm. What life do I want? I saw one life that even though, you know what, every odd was against my father as well, just like my mother. But, my, you know, but the only difference is that my dad had a business mentality. And I'm not knocking my mom. My mom... Both hardworking examples of people. That's the hard part, that they're both hardworking examples of, of just hardworking families. But so seeing that, I said to myself, I want to become an entrepreneur. I want to take my wife to Puerto Vallarta. I want to travel. I want to give them that life, the same life my dad gave me. And I also want to take care of my mom because I want her to experience that life as well. Yeah. But in the oil, guess what? When, you don't, when you're her your whole life, go to school, get good grades, and get a good job, man, that sets you, for people who or, or don't have good memory retention, because, you know, the school system is prepped for memory retention. Yeah. And a person who has ADD like myself and I have a memory of a goldfish, yeah, school and me just don't mix like oil and water, man. You get, you get what I'm saying? So when a, a kid hears that he's dumb from the age of five years old to the age of 17 because you have straight Ds and Fs and you're in general ed classes and nobody tells you and you feel like you're stupid and kids make fun of you because you ask questions, you know what that does to your self-esteem? You know what that does to your, to your, to your self-worth? You know what that does to your, to your insecurities, to the way you feel about yourself? Every that that messes us up. That it's like a mental barrier where you feel that you can never accomplish anything in life because you've been told your whole life that unless you go to school, you get good grades and you get a good job, Matt, then you become successful. So people like me, like what, what about me? Yeah. What about me? I want a future as well. So, so for those of you that are logging in right now, by the way, there seems a whole another stream of new viewers are joining us. If you have, if you're just joining us right now, you're on with the Money Smart Guy, host of the Money Smart Show. I'm a co-owner of PHP Agency, entrepreneur, former United States Marine. Joining me today are my guests Alejandro Aguilar and Ricky Aguilar. And we're talking about whether rich get richer and, and, and the poor and the middle class are sliding to become poorer and poorer as the generations go by, but not with these two brothers, not with, that, not with these Aguilars. So you just heard from Alejandro Aguilar, the younger brother of the two here. Um, you heard about his story, about his, his observations growing up. Ricky, I want to hear from you, brother. You're the older, you're the oldest brother. Right. Um, but but at the same time, you know, uh, the, the, the common thought is go to school, get good grades, get a job. By yeah. the way, those of you watching this right now, that is dead. That, that, is, that, is a, that, is a, that is a dead concept. Another concept why the rich get richer is that they know that savers are losers. Right. If you're just waiting for your money to be saved to grow, that's a losing proposition. You want to make sure your money you save to invest. You save to get prepared for the next opportunity. So let's talk about that real quick. Uh, Ricky. What's your, what was your, I mean, you went to school, you went to, uh, you're, you're a foreman at the, the old field. You're making six figures. I mean, in your mind, compared to the hood in Bakersfield, you're making a lot of money, weren't you? 
Yeah, so Matt, just uh, so what, what ended up happening, a, a, a lot of what Alejandro Got the Wi-Fi connection. Alejandro, you still with me? I can, I can hear you. Their parents like that with the, with the entrepreneur mindset. The other one, I have an entrepreneur mindset. And, uh, you know, in 2008, when the market crashed, I saw my dad lose everything, right? So my dad loses everything. And uh, what ends up happening is that I realized that what we were lacking was a lot of uh, financial education, right? We didn't have that. We didn't, we didn't have the, somebody teaching us, a financial advisor teaching us what to do with our money and what not to do with our money. Um, so when I saw that, you know, you get a little scared. It was in 2008 that the, the recession happened in 2008, the crash that happened in 2008. And so, uh, when that ends up happening, we go into, uh, I go into the oil fields. I dropped out of high school, my junior year, going to the oil fields. I'm in the oil fields for about, you know, uh, what is it? About eight years. But I grew up prior to that because what Alejandro was saying about my mom, uh, grew up in a really bad area. Okay. So grew up in, in the hood in the East side of Bakersfield, you know, gang related, gang infested neighborhood, gangsters, killers, and dope dealers. So that being said, that's all we ever knew. That's all we were ever around. Um, so therefore, you know, naturally you get involved with that type of situation, with that type of environment. And then when you get involved with the type of environment, what ends up happening is your mindset, your mindset starts thinking just like that. And it doesn't really change. You, you start thinking that's the road to go down. Uh, but luckily you got out of, got out of there and went into the oil fields and I was there for about eight years. And then you start realizing that corporate America just wants to use you and spit you out. Yep. And then, uh, ended up going into, uh, my brother joins PHP and he tells me about it. I'm not like, I don't have anything against the company at the time, but I'm not really being supportive with them. And uh, finally, I started realizing that he's making some decent money, more than the six figures that I was making. I said, okay, it's time to start looking into this. It's, start, it's time to start looking into this and to see how this can benefit me. Because here I am working for a company for eight years, companies like Chevron and Shell making over $120,000, $30,000 a year, yet not being able to have that financial freedom that I'm looking for because my tax bracket is so high and because money seems to never be able to uh, be enough. So that being said, when I saw my brother going into, into a, a PHP, I said, okay, cool. Like, maybe it's going to work. Maybe it's not going to work. Skeptical, like a lot of people are naturally are. But when I saw what he was able to do and was able to do with the company and how much money he was able to make and how many families he was able to help, I said, okay, it's game time. I mean, the numbers numbers are numbers and math is math. It's time to look into this a little bit on a more serious note. R Ricky, you, you share a funny story on stage where Alejandro refused to get direct deposit from PHP agency opted to get hard checks instead. So, so, so what did your brother make you do at the mailbox? I think it froze. Something, something happened here. Hey, Rick, did you get that? I think it might be his Wi-Fi. Yeah, so, so his Wi -Fi. He, he's going to log back on. Can, can I tell the story really quick, man? Tell the story, bro. Right, tell the story. Right, now, that, now, that, now that Ricky's not live right now, I'm just kidding. Okay, so I can start into the business. I'm an oil field worker, east side kid, does, I don't know how to talk business, I don't know nothing, I'm like the most illiterate person who comes out of business. Now my, my ambition was to go learn business, Every, I mean I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but I didn't know how, right? So then I get in a car accident, I'm on disability, my mom tells me about this company, she says it's Obamacare, which we don't do Obamacare, I don't know why she said that, so I go to a meeting, I join the program, my brother tells me I'm crazy, he says, Alejandro, you're making 80 grand at your job, what are you doing trying to do this? This crap, go get a real job. Yeah. Matt, for two years, he's drilling me. Now, you have to understand, I'm the younger brother. And it's only me. I'm the youngest of the family. So my older brother's like my role model. Does that make sense? And so is my dad. Both my dad tells me, you better quit. Go quit. Quit the business. My brother tells me to quit the business for two years, man. And Woo! then all of a sudden, yeah, so my first year license, my first year license, I make 34000 So it's not a lot of money. I'm not impressing nobody in the family. Everybody thinks like, yo, you went from making 80-something grand to making 34000 that's whack. But but you, but you you still had your job though, right? You still had your job and you started your no. Or you so went all in. I, I went all in. No. Wow. You know, like, I, once my license came in, I was like, look, man, I need to capitalize. If I don't get out now, I'm gonna stay in this damn oil fields forever. I need to make a decision. I saw my parents getting older. I saw my older brother still working at a job. My brother's a monster. He's a beast. He's a phenomenal businessman. But he was stuck in a freaking oil field job that paid him over six figures. But still, his self worth was more than that. I knew that. I know my brother. And I said, if I don't do it, then who the hell is going to do it? So finally, I finally started running the business. Do you remember that Puerto Vallarta trip we had over there in Puerto Vallarta? You remember that trip? Of course. Of course, we had okay. that. Tacos de Pastor con Piña. Yeah, Pastor con Piña. <laughs> yeah, I still remember that. All right, so I, the first person I bumped into is Rodolfo Vargas. And we started having a conversation. Remember, now, Mike, I'm about to have a kid during this time. I'm only making 34000 in my business. So we're not, we're not in the best position financially, if that makes any sense. Yeah. I talked to Rodolfo Vargas. Talk to a mentor. I talk to you. That next month, when I go back, I make six thousand five hundred for the first time, which is decent. 
The, but let me tell you what I did though. When I made, when I saw, him, I made six thousand five hundred. I said, okay, this might not impress my brother, but if I can make double, then I might impress my brother. Yeah. So then I made twelve thousand five hundred. My brother still doesn't pay attention to me. I'm like, damn. I said, okay. Then I, then the next month, I said, okay, my check comes in. So by then, I I didn't want to get direct deposit because my brother had the key to the mailbox. We used to live together. So my brother goes, and I I can see my checks by Wednesday. What I'm gonna get get paid on Friday. Yeah. So my check shows up and it's like 3,200 bucks for one week, right? And I'm just like, oh, hell yeah. So I told Ricky, hey, Ricky, do me a favor. Um, can you see what my check is? I'm not too sure what my check's going to be, right? So then he goes, opens up the mailbox. He takes a picture, says, good job, little brother. That's all he says. I'm like, okay, didn't convince him. The next check is okay. like 4,700 for the next week. And then right. I, my, and I said, brother, can you do me a favor? Can you please check my check? I'm not too sure how much it is because he's the one with the key box, with the mail to the key box. And he says, he looks at it, he says, good job, little brother. Keep it up. I still don't get nothing. I'm like, damn. The next check comes in. That check is like another 4,700. That, and, and, and at that, that month, I made 18,000. So by the fourth check, my brother doesn't say nothing. He just says, Good job, little brother. I'm just like, damn. I'm like, when is he going to freaking finally admit that? I, like, I want to come do business with me. Like, come on, man. I know. I mean, 18,000 is pretty damn good. What do I got to do? Make 50? So one day I'm about to jump in the shower. And then I'm just like, all right. So I'm getting in the shower to go to the office. And then I get a phone call. And I'm just, and it's Ricky. And I'm like, hey, Ricky, what's up, brother? He's like, hey, Alejandro, you know, and I can see he's frustrated. I'm like, what's going on? He's like, look, this is going on at work. And you know what, bro? I'm so sick of this. And then I'm like, okay. So I'm like, what's up? He's like, you know, I've always liked business. So I'm thinking my brother knows I'm making money. He's going to want me to partner up with him to invest into a business that he has, which I'll also support him because he's my brother. And then he says, you know, I like those like business, but he says, so how does this PHP crap work? Guys, it's such a rough neck. It's such a rough neck there, Ricky. Hey, let, let, me yeah, show you, let, me, let me show you this picture from Puerto Vallarta. Can you go solo? solo. So this is, this, is a, this is a picture yeah, I think you're talking about there. Alejandro, yeah, having a conversation with us over dinner at, the, at a private villa, Millet Point Bay Shop Retreat with Patrick McDavid. That's a conversation we had. This is Alejandro making $35,000 a year just a few years ago. Broke. I didn't even have money to even eat that at, at, that, at that trip. Wow. But yeah. made it out to this private villa, invited, because you had to qualify for it. Yeah. And, uh, and look at him now. You know, uh, uh, both these, the, these gentlemen uh, earning $200,000 a year. Uh, Ricky, now let's talk about that real quick. Sometimes pride keeps us from asking the right questions. Right. Uh, they may or may not be in your situation, though. What kept you from asking questions? Um, well, why did you have to wait for a breaking point? So I think I, earlier I got cut off. I think we froze up a little bit. I'm not sure exactly what happened. But like I was saying, I, I think uh, I think what ended up happening, it wasn't, it, it, it wasn't, um, how can I explain it to you? I think what ended up happening was that I just didn't see financial services that the Latino community can do because keep in mind my dad owned the restaurant at this point before the market crashed my dad by the way my dad lost everything in 2008 like I'm saying every by that old we were already growing up in the hood like, we didn't have anything past that days old about going back to um, in Vegas restaurant owner because there was no businesses that could be built after 2008 and then um, my mom was a waitress for 10 years. So after the age of 10, we're like, legitimately, we're broke. Right? You know, I think myself, I didn't graduate high school. But financial services. Is it not mean that anybody I'm doing? Like, I come from a business. You know, you know, Ricky's got a Ricky's got a bad internet connection. R Ricky, yeah, I got I'm gonna put it in my office instead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, if, if he wants to come over to your office and, and do it from from your end, but uh, yeah, R Ricky's uh, Wi-Fi. We're hearing like every third word. Um, but I want to talk about that. He said that he didn't think that financial services or insurance was something that the Latino community needed. No. What would you say? What did you say to that? Let, let, let me tell you why. Let me tell you that mentality though. Okay, let's check okay. this out. A lot of immigrants come from America, from Mexico to Guatemala, to El Salvador, from different countries to America, correct? Yep. Most cultures, even in America, in high school or college or junior high, they're not teaching us about financial education. 
So now think about other countries, like other countries apart from America. If they're not teaching in America, uh, especially like other minority countries, they're not teaching them that either. No, they're not teaching in Philippines. Nothing. So when they come to this country, their mentality is survival. Their mentality is, I just gotta, I just gotta provide my family. I just gotta eat. Yep. I just gotta make that that my family's taken care of and the bills are paid. They're not thinking about old wolf. Young wolf is trying to hunt for the family now. Old wolf, they're not thinking about old wolf or how to protect old wolf. They're not thinking about that. Yep. So their kids, when they come to America, they don't teach their kids about my, money or financial services. Especially if you're Latino, when you're in the kitchen table, if you talk about money, that's disrespect. If you talk about death, if you talk about death, that's like, oh, don't say that because it's going to happen. So shut up. Don't talk about it. So those yeah. two subjects are not talked about. But you know what the funniest thing is? That Caucasian people have been doing financial services for the last 200 years for say. So they're leaving their people like they insure each other. They set each other up with mutual funds, IRAs, uh, Index Universal Lives. Accounts, businesses. Yeah, yeah, they're set up. Yeah. But our people come here to America, minorities, which is a lot of people, and they're not talking about those subjects. Yeah. But they're hardworking families. So when I'm a Latino, if I think about, oh, doing a business of financial services, there are people are like, dude, you're crazy. People don't even believe into that type of stuff. Yeah. Why? That's not the subject that we're talking about. Now, I can look at this industry in two different ways. Nobody talks about it. Nobody likes it. But nobody even likes even thinking about it. That's a bad business. Latinos don't even do that. that I can think about it that way. Yep. Or I can say, no, I can sharpen up my skills, master my craft, and learn how to get into that market. So guess what I did? I mastered my craft. I sharpened my skills. I said, that's the opportunity. Yeah, it might be a little bit more challenging, but you know what? That would be a lot easier than working a damn oil field 16 hours a day, living from cl uh, uh, clocking in, clocking out, living from paycheck to paycheck every day. Somebody tell me how much I'm worth a month, a year, a day for the rest of my life. Tell me how many vacations I can take, how many, how many 10 minute breaks I can take, how many minutes I have till my break is over. I said, that is harder than what I'm about to do. So, so I said, you know what? I'm going to play offense. I'm going to play offense. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to figure out how to get into the market. So entrepreneurship was plan A. And plan A stayed plan A. I was not going to back down because I knew it was a good industry. I knew there was money to be made. I knew that if I stayed at my job, I was going to be there, make 120 grand a year in a tow truck, 16-hour days, never seen my wife, never seen my kids, li living like that six days out of the week, having one Sunday off for the rest of my life to the day that I died. And I didn't want to live like that, Matt. And so Alejandro's talking about something very profound in the Latino community where they don't believe that financial is a business to do. Go ahead, go, go ahead Solo. So I want, to, I want to share with you guys something. Um, Oscar De La Hoya, if you guys didn't know, Oscar De La Hoya is an investor in our company, PHP Agency, gave us $10 million, gave us, gave us $10 million in August to expand the infrastructure of our company. So he believes a lot in what we do. And for those of you that want to see this interview with our CEO, Patrick Bedavid, and Oscar De La Hoya talking about why he invested $10 million into PHP Agency is exactly what Alejandro just mentioned there too as well. So let's, let's get back to uh, Alejandro and now Ricky in the same uh, in the same area. Dude. There you are. There they are the brothers. There's the brothers. I'm back. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that, man. So yeah. to answer your question here, bro, um, like I was saying, you know, I, I seen my mom uh, again. Like the the market crashed in 2008. So the businesses that my dad had in 2008, they were gone. Mm -hmm. At the age of 10 years old, we didn't have anything anymore. We had a single mom working two jobs, uh, working as a waitress and selling tequila. And my dad was wondering if he was going to go back to Mexico or be a waiter in Vegas because there was no jobs, no businesses to start, right? So at that point, what ends up happening is that when you start seeing that um, and, and, you know, financial services comes around, it's not something that the Hispanic community does. It's not popular to us. Mm -hmm. So when I'm thinking to myself, my brother's going into financial services, I'm like, bro, if you would open up a restaurant, I would have supported you more than doing this because it's not familiar to us. Yeah. Right? So what do you mean financial services? This is like some wolf of I, – and I remember speaking to myself <laughs> – this guy's watching too much Wolf of Wall Street. Like, what the hell is his problem? You know what I mean? I'm like, he's been watching way too many movies. Somebody somebody told him to watch The Boiler Room, and he got all hyped up about it, right? So <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, and, and I'm thinking to myself, how do you say, hey, I'm going to open up a dealership. I'm going to open up a restaurant. I think I would have been a lot more prone to support him had that been the case. But when he told me financial services, so it wasn't so much, you know, your question was earlier, Matt, was it ego not joining or, or pride? No, it's really the unknown. I'm thinking to myself, we don't know this industry. If you would have said anything else, partner up, let's do it. But when you're talking about, you know, partnering up to do financial services, I'm like, what in the hell's financial services and what the hell are you talking about? Does that make sense? So that's the way I was, that's the way I, I, I mean, that was my perception towards financial services whenever he brought it up. 
Yeah, that's awesome, man. So let, let's talk about this. So, you know, number one is the economy. There's things we can control and things that we can't control. So so let's talk about this real quick. Remember, remember a couple of years ago, guys, we we, uh, we did a tour in Bakersfield. It was called the Vote yes. 1099 Tour. And yes. uh, I had a chance to go over there and visit you guys in in um, in Bakersfield. Uh, vote 1099 means either have a job or go in business for yourself. Okay? Yeah. So what are some of the mentalities that people say, if, I, if I'm going to get richer, am I, am I going to get richer with a $100,000 a year job? Am I going to get richer with a $200,000 a year job? Or do I, would, would you rather have a $200,000 business versus a $200,000 salary? Good question. Um, look, Matt, if it's okay for me to give my input here. Yeah, um, please. Look, we have to remember one thing. That China, India, these countries are, are a lot older than we are, have more culture, more everything, for say. How did America become one of the most powerful industrial countries of the world? Very, very simple. Capitalistic country. People came to America. In the 1800s, 95% of America were self-employed. 5% of America worked for somebody else. What's happened today? About 7.8% of America is self-employed now. The rest are employees. What does that mean? Even if I give myself a $200,000 job, let's be honest. Toys R Us, JCPenney. Sears, what is happening? All these positions that people have, imagine the guys at the top of the corporate companies making two, three, four hundred thousand dollars a year. Imagine that. They didn't innovate, they didn't change, they weren't creative. They had something called a nine to five job, J O B. And as long as you have a job and your income depends on somebody's house, because if I'm the entrepreneur and you're the employee and I'm paying you 200 grand a year, your, lot, your kid's future, your kid's college, your kid's, your wife's uh, pension, everything, everything that your wife and your kids might. I have it depends on me if I hire you, even if I pay you 200 grand. So the day that either I make bad business decisions or I'm not being creative or I get com uh, complacent or I stop being creative or I, I don't bust my ass, my employees might lose their position. So the, the position is not in the employee. You're, if you're an employee, your future is not in your hands. It's in my hands. I'm the entrepreneur for say, this is just a scenario. Imagine I'm the CEO of Toys R Us. And I'm paying you 250 grand a year. You're getting paid 20 grand a month. Your kids are going to good schools. They're in Berkeley. Let's just say they're in, in, I don't know, Stanford. And I'm paying for them to go to those schools. I make really good money. I've been making this money for 10 years. Boom, innovation comes. Boom, Instagram comes. Amazon comes. Snapchat comes. Facebook comes and starts wiping me out. Now I have 29-year-old, 32-year-old millennials taking me out out of business. Imagine that. So now my future, your future that you depended on, now is at jeopardy because why? You weren't the business owner, you were an employee. So hmm. what's the difference between making 250 grand as an employee and making 250 grand as a business owner? The employee's future will always be at risk because it's under somebody else's control. That's right. The business owner, if you're a business owner, if you make 250 grand, that means that's self-generated, self-made money. That means you know how to create production. That, like, for example, Cuba almost died on us. Why? Because they were a consuming country. They were consuming. They were not producers. Yeah. So, in other words, they weren't capitalists. They weren't capitalistic. So, what ends up happening is when they cut them off, they almost died. Yeah. People were dying of hunger in Cuba. You know what's crazy, guys? That as a business owner, if you can make 250 grand self generated, that means like you created your 250. What makes you think you can't make 500,000? And if you can make 500,000, what makes you think you can't make 750? And if you can't make if you can make seven fifty, what makes you think you can't make one one million dollars like Matt Safari? If you can make one million, why can't you make two million? If you can make two million, how many more jobs are you providing? Think about that. How, if you make uh, let's just let's let me give you an example. I make over two hundred grand. Perfect. I have two assistants. I have I provide for my wife. I have agents. And my agents have houses. They're buying cars. How many more jobs are we providing as entrepreneurs? How many more jobs? And if I look, I, I'm sorry, but Matt, I'm not, I'm not trying to brag here, but look, I'm 27 years old. I still got right. easily another 20 years of energy inside me, baby. You see this heartbeat? This Come is on, not going to stop, hopefully. Leon. Stop. Does that make sense? So if I make 200 grand right now at 27, what makes you think I won't make my first million? Let's think about that for a second. But it's not just me. There's nothing special about us. We just have one vision and one goal, not to be an employee and to go out there and become entrepreneurs. That's what it is. Because we know that the economy is against us. Inflation is 3%. Taxes are rising. Even if you get that dollar raise at your job with the cost of living going up, you're still negative. So what, what is our, what's our solution? Make more money. That's the only solution. How? By being a producer. Being self-employed.
It's, a lot of people think uh, too, at the same time, Matt. A lot of people have the fear of 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 you know just becoming business owners. And my thing is to me is this: if you have the fear of that, then like Alejandro said, if you know piggyback off of that. My fear is another man telling me you're fired. Those two words can completely destroy my financial stability. Those two Ooh. words can completely change my entire life. So what are you more scared of? You know, people say that people like us are fearless. Like, you guys are so fearless. No, we fear a lot. We fear poverty. We fear another man having control over our life. We fear somebody saying, hey, you don't want to have this job and you can't feed your family anymore. Yep. So in reality, there's a lot of fears. I mean, is it scary to start your business? It is. But it's not scary when you have mentors like yourself, like me yeah. and my brother, that, you know, have to be able to say, hey, listen, Matt, like we did even before we started this video. Brother, I need some help. How can we do this? Boom, 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 boom. When you have the mentors and you have the right sources to be able to help you and the right tools, then you can't fail. Sure, you're going to go through some hurdles. Sure, you're going to go through some bumps and scrapes. Yes, you're going to go through it. But at the end of the day, I'm more scared of giving another person control of my life than I'm scared of me controlling my own life. I trust me. I don't trust another man. Why? Because they're not invested in me in any way, shape, or form. Not emotionally, not financially, not in any other sense. So therefore, the fact of another man that doesn't know me, that has no sympathy for me, that doesn't love me, having that much control over my life, that's scarier than me starting a business and potentially being able to control my own income. So it's really what fear are you going to choose? That's what it comes down to. But you're going to fear something at any point in time. Yeah, the person that controls your income controls you. And... If you have that control with somebody else, you know, the, the, the crazy part about it, people sign for a 30-year mortgage on a property. They sign for a five, six-year on, on, on a car loan. They sign for 20 years on a student loan. Is there a guarantee of a J-O-B for 20 years or how long you've had that mortgage? No. Nope. You know, at least when I was in the military, when I was in military and I signed for a two-year or three-year car loan, at least I knew I was enlisted for four years with a guaranteed job in the military to pay my, my car loan. But with, without that guarantee of a job, I, I don't know how, how people are, are saying, I'll promise to pay, but I don't have a promise to earn. So it's either you're earning money from a job or you're creating income. Like Allah said earlier, you're creating income on yourself. Um, so, so that's the economy. So let's, let's talk. You know, uh, Dan Trey asked a question earlier. So you guys are talking about being in a business where the Latino community doesn't think it's sexy or it's cool or something that's needed. So how do you create it to be sexy? How do you create the need for it? How do you create people say, you know what? I do it because you guys are obviously knocking it out the park uh, with no previous financial background and you got a thriving business. By the way, where what cities is your business now? What's the spider web? You guys are more cities now than just Bakersfield. Yeah. So, for example, uh, uh, I, I we, we run the Bakersfield office, obviously. So we have the Bakersfield office. My brother and me, we're partners. Um, when I recruited my brother, uh, I'm an executive broker. He's a senior marketing director. He's a senior broker. He has an office in Visalia. So he has another office over there. He has over 120, 130 agents going nice. out there, like, running business out there as well. Then we have Visalia, which is like an hour and 45 minutes away from here. Then we also, I have an office over there in Santa Ana as well. Uh, one of my brokers that I, that I had that came from a practice company, she opened up an office over there, has about another 30, 40, 50 agents over there tra uh, training as well. Uh, over here, uh, Bakersfield. Practice company, practice company being, uh, was it uh, Primerica? Primerica. Our, our World Financial Group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so World, Financial. World Financial Group. Yeah, so she was, she was a ring earner. Um, she was doing really well. Uh, she comes from WG and, and she messaged me on Facebook and she says, hey, you know what? My company, unfortunately, is not helping out the Latinos because they have a certain social called I-10. So you know a lot of people that don't have documents, they'll give them an I-10 number to do their taxes instead. So a lot of carriers that the, the WG was representing wasn't really accepting them. So what ended up happening was that when she saw that that I was a minority and I was in the industry and I was a ringer and she saw my progress in business. I guess she heard about me. She sent me a message. We started having a conversation. We saw a lot of commonality. We saw that our people needed to be helped. She saw that how much there's a huge need for our people. Because if you see this, and just, so you, just so you know, that when she saw that, when she saw that, that our company was like all about helping our people. And not only that, but really giving the, the, the news person opportunity and the minorities an opportunity to even ensure their family members who didn't even have documents. And help them with retirement plans and life insurance. She said, I'm all in. So she comes on board. She tears it up. She's running a Santa Ana office. Her name's, I don't know if I should say her name, but her name's Ilvana. She's amazing. And yeah. we're just really, we're so happy to have her on board. Honestly, she's like a sister now in business with us. So we're really happy. So your energy and your volume and your decisions are actually impacting other people. Not just people who have never been involved in the community in financial services, but other people that are already in financial services already. They're making yeah. a switch, switch in Jersey to come yeah. in business. You guys, 
Yeah. You know, by the way, that's that's why the rich get richer. They understand a, they understand a rich industry. And they also understand a platform that they can express them on because people work really really hard. They just pick the wrong platform. You know, yeah. uh, Ricky, you you're in charge of people. You were, you were a foreman, weren't you? Yeah, I was a I was a rig supervisor in the oil fields for companies like Chevron and Shell. Uh -huh. Yeah, so so you work really really hard. You supervise people that were working really really hard. Right. But they weren't getting any richer. So no. it's, it's all about the platform. So, so so talk to me about what that that decision is like to switch from you know what I'm working sixty hours for somebody else. Now let me consider working sixty hours for me, but I don't have any time though. How do you make it? How do you make it work? Well, and it, it, it goes back to what Alejandro was saying too, man. I mean, it just. Is you start you start looking at different at life in a different perspective. So I'm thinking to myself, here I am building the company. By the way, I'm very grateful grateful to the company that allowed me to pay my bills for so many years and allowed me to have a, a somewhat of a comfortable lifestyle. But I realize I'm 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 building the company for a man. Nobody ever. I'm never gonna be able to own it. Then I started thinking. I started put, putting things in perspective. I can continue to do this and bust my butt to get X amount of dollars an hour, or I can go out there and do something bigger with my life. So again, it, it was, it was that it was, it was watching over people and thinking to myself, now I'm supervising guys that have double my experience and they are, they, they are working for me. So now I'm thinking to myself, if I continue like this, what's going to be my outcome? I was more scared of the future of corporate America than I was scared to come over here. It was a fear, it was a genuine fear of wondering to myself, what is my what is my life gonna look like for the next 20 years? So when you start to, the, the, not putting things in perspective, right? So what happens is that when I put my life in perspective and I started watching these 56 year old men that I had to tell them what to do and that had been with the company for 20 years, I'm thinking to myself, that scared me. It scared the crap out of me. <laughs> and I said, you know what? I, I, okay, I don't have time. I gotta make time. And, I, and I'm, gonna tell, I'm not going to tell anybody, I'm not going to suggest anybody do what I did, um, you know, but I, I started saving up some money um, because especially if you're making that kind of money, you know, you're making over six figures, you can save some money. You just choose not to do so. But I thought to myself, I got to prepare myself for this. So I was already looking to get into a business even two or three months prior. So I started saving some money. I said, look, I'm going to put away two months worth of bills, just two, three months worth of bills. So I did that for three months prior to me coming to PHP, not because I was intending to come here, but because I already had in mind that I was going to leave the oil fields anyway. So I started putting money away. So one day I decided to myself, if I don't make a leap now and I don't make this jump now, I'm never going to do it. There's never going to be the perfect time. It'll never be the perfect weather. There'll never be the perfect day. There'll never be the perfect month. So you got to make the time perfect for yourself. So I put the money away and I said, okay, let's go. I, I, I remember uh, putting in my two week notice and uh, uh, which was my, my supervisor, which I loved very much. I, I really did genuinely love the man. And I give him a, and I give him a call and I said, hey, listen, um, uh, T, I'm not going to say his full name, T. Um, I'm putting my two-week notices in my two-week notice. And that's when I realized I made the right decision. And he says, are you sure you want to do that? Do you want to give up this position? You know, there's not an easy position to get. I said, I'm 100% sure. Thank you for everything that you've done for me. Um, I appreciate it. Can I finish my two weeks? Because I, I actually needed those. I was, Matt, I became, I became full-time April 1st of 2016. I was already engaged, getting ready to get married in October yeah. of the same year, right? So I'm thinking to myself, holy crap, I'm going to make a career job. I'm not going to have this income. And I got a $30,000 wedding coming up. So it was a scary moment at my time. I'm, I'm 29, going to be 30 years old here in about four days. Like It wasn't like I'm a 19-year-old kid with no responsibilities. So I'm thinking to myself, holy crap, okay, no, it's okay. I, I, you know, 80% of this business is faith. I'm going to put my faith in God. I'm going to go do what I got to do. But again... Uh, 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 I give him a call at 8 in the morning. By 10 o'clock in the morning, I'm getting a phone call from HR. Now, HR is not somebody that calls me unless I fired somebody. They say, hey, Ricky, listen, go ahead and pack your stuff and take it to the yard. And I'm thinking to myself, take it to the yard? What, what do you mean? I just talked to Terry. He's going to let me finish out my two weeks. No, Terry said you're done. And it just wow. pushed me. And I realized if this man that I had been loyal to for so many years in this company didn't even have the audacity of calling me and telling me, hey, you can leave. I was done. Like, I realized I made the right choice. And sometimes you don't realize you make the right choice until after you make it. Yep. But the thing is, you've got to make that first choice. You've got to make that first step. Because if you don't do it, you don't realize what's on the other side. You don't realize that God has a blessing for you on the other side. So whenever I, I made the phone call at 8 o'clock, I was shaking, Matt. I was shit. I'm like, man, I'm going to put it. I've been in this company for eight years. I'm a supervisor. I got one of the highest positions. They're getting ready to offer me a... a, a 
uh, uh, engineer position. Like, I'm like, holy crap, am I really making the right choice? As soon as I hang up, I feel a little bit of relief, but I'm still scared. Two hours later, when I get that phone call from the HR department, I realized I had made the right choice. God was just giving me a sign. He was just waiting to see how far I was, go I was willing to go. Needless to say, after that, come in the company, get licensed, and then after that, we don't start making less than ten. We don't make less than ten thousand dollars a month after we get licensed and appointed through the companies that we represent. So again, it, it, it has a lot to do with faith, Matt. Um, you know, eighty percent of this business is faith. It's having faith. The big guy upstairs is watching over you, and as long as you make the right decision, you do people right, you don't cheat, lie, or steal, that you're gonna be okay. Yeah. A lot of it has to do with faith, man. It's it's not for sure. Nothing's for sure in this world. I just knew one thing. As long as I work hard and I put things in God's hand and I, and I do my part, I'm going to be all right. It had a lot to do with faith. Hey, guys, if you're tuning in right now, you're watching this on a replay or just join us, joining us live, you're watching The Money Smart Guy and The Money Smart Show with my guest, Ricky and Alejandro Aguilar. We're talking about whether rich get richer, and it's really this simple. Um, if you are sharing this, I want to I want to, I want to honor it and reward those who share this live stream video the most. This Saturday, I'm speaking at the Me Murder Mediocrity Tour hosted by Chicago radio host, Linal Harris, who has a show called Perspectives, on Sunday mornings from 7 to 9 a.m. He's hosting this event called Murder Mediocrity. He's gonna talk about relationships. He's gonna talk about work-life balance. He's gonna talk about purpose. He's gonna talk about your spirituality. And I'm talking about money. Four or five different guests, I think four or five different guest speakers at this thing. It's a hundred dollar event. I got two tickets to give to you for free. If you're one of the people that share this the most, you'll get two tickets for me, you and your spouse, you and a guest, you and an associate, you and a team member, you and a business partner. Come to this just by sharing this video. Tickets on me. We're gonna go, we're gonna audit this with Brandon to see who shares it the most uh, amount this video most amount of times, and we're gonna, we're gonna reward you. With these tickets, of course, you got to be in the Chicago land area. Or if you want to fly into Chicago, I got two, two things for you. You got to pay for your own way to get out of here. But I'm going to pick up your tickets um, to the Murder Mediocrity event tour this Saturday, March 31st, here at the Lakewood in Chicago. All right. Last, last thought process before I let you guys go out, because I know this is a closeout week for all of us. But let's talk about leadership. Let's talk about leadership. Online to get rich. If you search online how to get rich, how to make $100,000, how to make seven figures. There's all sorts of videos out there on how to get rich, all sorts of videos on how to make six figures, all sorts of videos on how to make seven figures. So if there's not a lack of information to get to get wealthy, my, my thought process is because there's lack of leadership. It's not information, but leadership. How are you guys expressing your leadership on, on a daily basis, growing your enterprise uh, as, as entrepreneurs? Uh, personally, in your home or personally in your, in your business, how are you guys expressing leadership to get richer as time goes as time goes on? Okay, so can I, I'm gonna give I'm gonna start and, and I'll let my brother shine in right now as well. Um, so Matt, let, let me give you an example. I believe that in business you're supposed to give people a good a, a good opportunity and give them a good example. So for example, leadership. I believe that people are taught by example. So guess what I do? Look, I, I make. You know, besides Hector Del Toro in the office, you know, we, we all make over six figures, me, my brother, Hector Del Toro, but I like to be the first one in the office, man. I like to be one of the first ones in the office. I like to show up early. I like to show my guys that I'm in the trenches with them. I, I, I'm the, I like to show up early. I like to give that example. I like to do the things that other people are not willing to do. I like to make those phone calls that other people are not willing to make. Why? Because I want to show them that I'm also scared, but I'm going to do it regardless. So my way of looking at business is this. Let me give you an example, Matt. If I'm at home, I'm married. I have a beautiful wife. I got two beautiful children, Alexander and little baby Angelo, which looks like Ricky, by the way, which is weird. But anyways, going back to it, um, I got my wife. And, I, and the way I look at it like this is this. How can I treat my wife? How can I treat a client who comes in? Let's just say I have a client who just has some questions, is a little bit bothered, comes in. The client's frustrated. Okay, let's talk. Let's process it. Tell me, man, what do I do? Okay, and let's just say it's my fault, right? I'm going to say, you know what, man? Completely my fault, my mistake. I do apologize. You know, I'm going to make this better for you, right? I have to do something in order to make my client feel better. If there's a, a situation between me and the client, for say. Well, how can I treat my wife when there's an issue between me and my wife? I can't be like, well, don't talk to me. I can't, I, I can't treat my wife less than I would treat my client. Why? Because why? Because my, my client puts some money in my pocket? What about my wife? I wake up to her for the rest of my life. Yeah. Who deserves more respect? Who deserves more love and respect? 
my client or my wife? My wife. Yeah. So why do I say that? Because as a leader, things have to be good at home. I have to be a good husband. I have to be a good father. I have to have the moral authority that when I sit down with the family and I say, sir, isn't it our obligation to, to sustain, maintain physically in every way to make sure our family's taken care of? But imagine that I don't take care of my family, get at home. That's hypocrisy. That's awesome. So my, business, my business starts at home. So why do I say that as leadership? Because my character has to evolve into a better person to lead my family and to lead an organization. And mm -hmm. if I can lead an organization, there's going to be other couples that they're going to have issues where they don't know how to process or they don't know how to talk and they don't know how to go along and they can kill in business, but they don't know how to be aligned. So guess what I do as, as a leader? I have to sit there, process issues with them, talk to them. You don't know how many marriages, Matt. You'll be surprised. I'm 27 years old. You'll be surprised how many marriages in my business I've saved by sitting down and processing issues with those couples. So for me as an example in business, it doesn't start with just making money. It starts with the characteristics of the personality, not the personality, but your characteristics, your, the way you even treat your things at home as a leader. So when I go to the business, I have more authority to lead an organization now. And on top of that, I'm backing up with my work ethic, with my example. I'm in the trenches with my guys. I'm off to one of the last ones to leave the office as well. So think about that. Matt, I see your Snapchat. You're always with your family. You're always in the office. You're always going exploring the different cities and your different places. You're, you're enjoying life. You're, you can see the awesome relationship you have with your kids. Guess what? As a, if, I'm in, if I'm not in the business and I'm looking at that, I'm saying, this man not only does he support his kids, he has a good relationship. His wife loves him. Like, I see the relationship you have with Sheena, man. You guys act like you are still high school sweethearts, which is beautiful. <laughs> You get me? And it's like, man, that's awesome. So why does that have to do with business, man? Because for you to be successful, you need leaders who also have good characters at home and also in the business. Because if he handles things at home, he's going to handle things in business as well. And not only that, but I got to make sure that the leader that I'm working with is also very sharp in the industry that we're going to be going into. I want to know if he's going to be leading me, that he's going to lead me into an industry that's a demand. That I'm not going to be replaced like Toys R Us or all these different other companies. So when I look about like, okay, success and leadership, I'm looking, okay, is the guy's work ethic? Where's the guy's work ethic at? How's the development? How's this things at home? I want that because if I'm going to follow your advice, Matt, I'm going to make sure that you even at home things are good because I don't want your money if your things at home are crappy. I don't want that life. I'm sorry. You can keep the money. I want a good, healthy relationship with my family. That's what I work for, for either way. So for me, leadership, Matt, has a lot to do with the way you run things Oh, they're, they're in a cut up. Man, Alejandro's on a roll, guys. He was on a roll. Maybe they can uh, tune back in. But uh, send, yeah, send him, a, send him a message that they're, that they're uh, internet cut out. So, hey, guys, if you're tuning in, you listen to the Money Smart Show. My guests, Ricky and Alejandro Aguilar, out of Bakersfield, California. They'll be back right with us. But, guys, we're having a conversation today about why the rich are getting richer and why the poor and the middle class are sliding to become poor. And we're at a breaking point in our, in our lives, in our, in our country. Yeah, yeah, Adam Macon. We're at a breaking point in our country. You have to make a decision. You have to make a decision from here going forward to get richer. And if you don't make a decision, by default, you're going to get poor. R Ricky, I'm glad you guys are back on. So, Ricky, let's, let's talk to us about that. Uh, what does leadership to you mean as an entrepreneur? Because there's so much information out there on how to get rich, real estate, Bitcoin, even our business insurance, being totally objective and, 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 and uh, 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 unbiased here because people want to defend why they should, why they should go join their business? We've chosen. We plant our flag in the insurance industry. We plant our flag, and we're very proud to wear the the jersey of PHP Agency, the fastest growing financial market organization in the country. And everything rises and falls on leadership. How do you express leadership to help people go from poor to middle class to getting rich to getting richer? Well, I'm a big believer, Matt, that success leaves clues, right? So. Even though I understand having these big uh, goals and dreams and, and wanting to lead people um, and, and wanting, to, and, and wanting to, to watch videos on how to become leaders and, and how to do all these things. And I, and I get all that. I understand that. But the, what I'm looking for, not only when I'm becoming a leader, because obviously I'm a leader in my organization, but what I'm looking for is, is I'm not looking to see what you can say. I want to look to see what you can prove. Right, so me, yeah. if, I'm this, if I'm this new person, if I'm this new person um, out there looking for a, for a route or somewhere to go, I'm not going to look at what you say because a lot of people talk pretty. A lot of people put on a good show. A lot of people say, like when I watch these ads on Instagram, 
Um, I can teach you to make $10,000 on a part-time basis in one day. Bullshit. There's no right. way. I mean, hey. Anybody that works hard knows or anybody that becomes successful knows that it takes a lot of work. There's no way that that can be offered. So when I'm, if I'm this new person looking into this entrepreneurship world and wondering what direction I should take, what I'm looking at is, are, is it even feasible? Is it true? I, I, what, what success, what track record does this person have to show that they can lead me. So that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at to see, you know, what kind of content do they, do they have? Are they just trying to sell me their programs? No names. Yep. Are they just trying to, are they putting out content so I can really learn from it? Do they, are they feeding me value? Are they feeding me enough information that's going to help me make the right decisions? Or are they just trying to sell me a packet? Because if that's all you're trying to do and you're the new person looking in, then you have to realize that you cannot be fooled just because it's it, it just because it, it, you know crap is sprinkled with sugar, it doesn't make it taste good. You know what I'm saying? You have to know where the course is coming from. So in my example, when I follow people like you, because obviously you're one of my mentors, and I follow people, I follow people for uh, like Patrick, I'm realizing I'm watching your track record. They went from here to here, then they went to here from here. I do my homework. I'm not just gonna get you know I'm not gonna get all excited about a, a certain ad. I want to know, huh? This person has put this ad. Let me look at their track record. Let me see if I can find them. Let me see who knows them. Let me look on YouTube to find what kind of content they have. So to me, leadership is really leading from the front, setting the example and having that moral authority of saying, listen, this is what I've been able to do. This is why you should follow me. Not just saying that. And it's being the example on a daily basis. Leaders eat last, okay? And a leader realizes that the only way to get ahead is putting your people first. Yeah. And the only way to get ahead is understanding that the only way you win is if others win before you do. And it, and it comes down to always setting the example and at the same time is realizing that you cannot just sit there and try to fool people because these are God's people. And at some point in time, God's going to take the blind away and they're going to realize that you're full of crap. And we've seen that so many times with these influencers on Instagram and, and, and motivational speakers Man, I'm an influencer. Hello. Influencer Hello. of what? You can't even you can't even get yourself where you need to get. You <laughs> want to influence people? Like, are you serious? Who are you influencing? Yeah. So to me, leadership is setting the example, is having that track record of busting your ass every single day and showing that you are gonna do it first. Leaders do it first. Lincoln on leadership, which is one of my favorite books. Um, Lincoln was the one, he was in the trenches with these guys. He didn't say, hey, go to war and just watch them from the White House. The man was in the trenches. Is a person telling you, hey, listen, I can help you become successful. Are they in the, are, do they have their boots on the ground? Do they have their rifle in their hand? Are they willing to stand next to you and go to battle? Or they say, hey, you do this and you do that and you do this. Because that's a manager. It's a manager that wants to make money off of motivating you, telling you they can lead you. I'm looking for leadership. I'm, looking for, I'm not looking for management. So, again, as a leader, to me, setting the example, doing it first. Leaders eat last. Always showing that you're willing to do it first before you ask somebody to do something, you do it first. And then on top of that, if I'm the new person looking in, I want to see if these guys are grinding. Are they in the game? Do they got fresh legs? Are they really willing to put in the work? Are they willing to meet me? Are they willing to call me? Are they willing to have a conference call with me? Are they willing for me to talk to them whenever I need them? So that's from two different perspectives as a leader and a new person looking for a company or an individual to follow. Man, I'll be honest with you. When I, when I looked at leadership, when I had a conversation with Patrick, and when I had a conversation with you, um, I immediately felt that you guys, not only physically, but mentally, your minds were in the right places. What really took off for me was seeing that you guys were willing to work. That was a big one for me. Because I said, look, like Erika Del Toro, when she mentored me, I saw this lady, she lived in LA, I live in Bakersfield. She would drive two hours every day to come train me. Okay, wow. she will run for me all day long. It's nine o'clock at night, eleven o'clock at night. She's still in the office with me. She says, "Okay, guys, I'm going back home." I said, "Okay, Erica, wait. What do you mean you live in LA?" She's like, "Yeah, I'm gonna drive me home." I said, "Erica, it's eleven o'clock at night. Yeah, me home, but I gotta go." I'm like, "Erica, you, you stay. What do you mean? <laughs> so, I gotta go." Boom, and she'll take off. I'm like, "Hector, you guys are leaving." She's like, "Yeah, it's a two-hour drive." I'm like, "Are you kidding me?" I remember one time we finished a, a competition at seven, no, six in the morning. We finished, so we worked literally from eight o'clock in the morning till six o'clock in the morning the next day. And then she says, and then Hector's like, okay, guys, so I'm going to go home. I'm like, what are you talking about? That was work ethic. And I said, these guys are not going to stop. They're not going to stop. They're not going to stop. And you could, no matter what happens, if a person's worth ethic, worth ethic, worth ethic I'm sorry, is that powerful and that strong, 
What makes me think they're not going to become successful? They're going to make it happen. And I was with Hector and Erica before they even got their ring. I was with Hector and Erica before they even got their $50,000 launch. I was with Hector and Erica before they got to $250,000. I was with Eric and Hector before they made four hundred fifty grand. I was with them. I saw them work their asses off. And I said, that's why I want these guys in my life. Because they're not just going to tell me. They're going to show me by example and by my sign. That's why I wanted to join PHP. And that's the reason I, I fell in love with the company, guys. By the way, I think uh, Erica is watching the live stream too as well. A big shout out to Erica Del Toro. Uh, just dropped a comment too as well. Appreciate your leadership, Erica, because without you doing that, these gentlemen here would be still stuck in an yep. old room. Absolutely. Right? So, hey guys, listen, as we wrap stuff up, you're one conversation away. You're one decision away. You're one mindset shift away to changing your life forever. Instead of just selling for what the man's going to uh, pay you and, and, and get you, you're one decision, one conversation, one mentorship, one appointment away, one serious heart to heart away from finally beginning the path to get richer in your life. I believe that. Listen, guys, notice during this whole time, we didn't talk about investments. Even though we're in the insurance industry, we didn't talk about insurance. It's all right here. It's all about the mindset, it's all about the attitude. A lot of this stuff we can fix, but if you got a bad attitude, we can't help you. We can help shift the mindset, but you got to be around. And if you guys are in the Bakersfield, California area, the Visalia area, San Jose, where the where the where are your other offices, guys? So Bakersfield, where else? Yeah, we have. So uh, also with Dotoros, we have the uh, a Fresno office. We have an office in Visalia, which is a few a few, a few minutes away from uh, Fresno as well. We also have the Santa Ana office. Uh, what else? Office? We have the. There's an office in Arizona as well that's run by the Santa office. Ana. Santa Ana. Santa Ana. Next corner. Santa Ana. Santana, Santana. Yeah, right next to Orange County. Santa Maria. Santa Maria as well. Pis Pismo Beach area. Um, uh, I believe it's uh, uh, Palm Springs. Palm Springs. So we're 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 definitely in 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 uh, a heavy in the Southern California area, and uh, we're pushing up north as well. So we're 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 dominating again. It's because the leaders are willing to put their boots on the ground, and we're ready to carry our rifles and go to war with you. We're not just gonna sit here and tell you what to do. Matter of fact, in in about. An hour, I'm leaving to Porterville, California, running an appointment. One appointment, an hour away, just because somebody wants the opportunity, wants to meet up with us, and we're gonna go that far, and we're gonna make sure that we 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 set the example. Uh, we're gonna eat last, and we're gonna do everything first. That's just what it comes down to. Matt, I will say one thing though. This is. Let me tell you why I'm a little bit excited. Let me tell you why I'm excited. Are you ready for this? Good. So, th th there's a there's a something going on in the industry. We already know what's happening with the baby boomers retiring. So, predict. They're saying by 2029. There's going to be 1 million licensed agents doing what we do. 1 million. So this is going to take off bigger than real estate, right? So let me tell you why I'm excited, though. Because if there's going to be 1 million licensed agents recruited by 2029 licensed agents in the country, right now, there's 149,000. You subtract 149,000 from, from a million, that's 851,000. Yep. That's in 11 years from today. So in 11 years, 851,000 people will be recruited to the industry. Please don't worry, baby. I'm working. I'm running, man. I got my license. I got license agents. I know what I'm doing. I'm making six figures in the street. I'll coach you guys, baby. Don't yeah. worry about it. If we get in now, we will train the next generations to come. We will train them. And what position? What would that position us? And next 11 years, 851,000 people are coming. To and they're going to learn about finances and money. This is going to be every kitchen table is going to be talking about finances and money. And guess what? Guess what, Matt? We're the ones leading the organization. We're yeah. the ones dealing with minorities. We're the ones setting up minorities for training. We're doing Spanish training now. Matt, we're training Spanish speakers who don't even speak English. The license in the Spanish now. We're training them. So all the people who are like negative and whatnot, all the millennials who are negative, don't worry. I'm recruiting your mom and your dad. Trust me, they're better workers either way. So Matt, what I'm saying is this. We are setting ourselves up. We are setting ourselves up tremendously right now where we're at. So for the people watching, just know. This train is going, it's not stopping anytime soon. Not, it's going to run over the haters, it's going to run over the naysayers, it's going to run over the, the competitors, everything. We're going to run, and we're running a thousand miles per hour. And by the way, we have a lot of energy still, man. We're not 70 years old, we're not 65 years old, we're good. Matt, you look very you look good yourself, man, look at you. You're, <laughs> you're healthier than me, and I'm 27. So, Matt, I'm excited for our future, brother. I really am. I'm, look, I'm looking forward to it. And, and just to think, I met you guys when you both were single, and now you guys are married. You guys are at $200,000 plus income. And this is only compounding from there. What a great investment that you guys made. Instead of being passive with your investments, 
you guys decide to invest in yourselves through the conference calls, qualifying for trips, qualifying for uh, specialized trainings. I just appreciate that example that you brothers have set. And, and, and uh, I love the picture. We're going to be posting it here. But I love it when your mother was on stage. And she says, I'm the only mother with inside PHP agency that has two boys. With, with, with Show your rings, guys. Let me show you your, show your rings. Higher. higher. Show your, there it is. There, there's the rings, man. Woo! I love That's it. Right, baby. <laughs> yeah, it's on Dying, man. So if you guys, if you guys are, are, are just now catching out, I appreciate you guys for watching. Make sure you were watching from the beginning. If you've been watching us throughout this whole duration of the show, thank you for staying tuned in. I know it was fire. I know this thing was lit. Make sure you share this video. Uh, over the next five or ten minutes, we're going to go back and audit those who shared it the most. And if you're in the Chicagoland area or if you want to fly into Chicago, I have two tickets for you to come this Saturday to the Murder Mediocrity where I'm a speaker at. Talk about uh, money and, and uh, work and money uh, here at the Murder Mediocrity Summit, hosted by Chicago radio host Lonell Harris. So, Ricky Alejandro, thank you for being so generous with your time. Absolutely. You guys, thank, you. thank you for having us, Matt. We appreciate you. Thank you know what's going to be funny? I'm going to look forward to watching this video a year from now, right, and, and see how much growth and income you've made uh, a year from now from this milestone video because it's going to be living on YouTube forever. I'm yeah. looking forward to seeing this video a year from now, man. See that, see Absolutely, how, man. I'm excited. I'm excited, excited bro. for the future. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to have Ricky and Alejandro. I'm your Money Smart Guy, Matt Spall. You've been watching the Money Smart Show. And until we meet again, make sure you like, click, comment, and share. Until we meet again, continue live smart, continue live smart. And be money smart today. Let's have a great close that week. Let's make it happen. Let's go, baby. All right, gents. Take care, guys. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.